Hey folks, welcome to Board Game Breakfast. My name is Tom Vassell, and this is the first Board Game Breakfast being recorded at the new Dice Tower Studios. Now, never everything is not set in stone yet. We're still going to be changing things and working around, but we're moved in finally. And we still have a studio set to be built and things like that. But if you go back this week, we've done a few videos of it. I didn't do a lot of live stuff because, well, we were working a lot, but we are um, getting stuff done. Now, this week, actually, by the time you watch this, I will be flying out to Nebraska where my parents live. My mom has been given just a few weeks to live or so, so I'm going out to see her as soon as I can. Um, and I, ahead of time, appreciate the nice thoughts and, and things that I, people have sent me in the past and all. And, you know, it is what it is, but I, I was able to record a lot of videos this week, so you'll see those going up um, regardless of me being gone. And when I get back, I might do a Q&A near the end of the week. So... Again, we appreciate you watching Board Game Breakfast. We're just going to get right into it. Let's start with the news. Not nearly as much news as last week, but here we go. Renegade. One of the games that I didn't mention last week is Scott Pilgrim's Precious Card Game. This is a deck building game based on the very popular comic of Scott Pilgrim. And you're going to be building a storyline and coming in and the cards are double-sided. And so you will be dealing with different situations either in an adult manner or through cartoon video game violence. How do you do that? I'm not sure how it works, but I'm sure this game will be very popular. Van Ryder Games has announced uh, a new game, Detective City of Angels, which looks cool. I hope this is as good as it looks. It's about big city noir detective type things. Uh, the artwork is by Vincent Dutrait. So, man, that's just, this is neat. A big box detective game. I hope it's good. And they've also announced an expansion for Saloon Tycoon, the ranch expansion. Has, uh, Haba uh, has told us some more details about Rhino Hero Super Battle. Rhino Hero is a game that I have in my collection. I love it. You're building cards, moving a rhino. Well, this one, there's multiple towers. There's multiple people moving around. You're fighting off evil monkeys. The towers will be joined by bridges. Is this too complex for what it is? We'll find out, but it looks super fascinating. Hasbro has announced the new Monopoly tokens for the four of you who care. Um, the Raptor, the Ducky, and the Penguin have made it. So long, Thimbles, so long, Wheelbarrow, so long, Shoe. I don't think I'm going to miss the, the... Oh, man, I use the Shoe sometimes. I use the Wheelbarrow. I never use the Thimble. Okay. DV Giochi has uh, announced a couple new games. Actually, they're coming out very soon. I know this because I have a copy of each of them. One is a Three Secrets, which is a cooperative, small card game cooperative for players. So that's interesting. And another is Deckscape. This is a their version of the escape room. This is a very hot thing these days. So I'm sure we'll see more of these as time goes by. Simon has announced Simon Play. This is going to be for retail stores. Simon uh, has certainly got their fair share of criticism over the time because they do these huge Kickstarters and big things which cater to not really retail stores. So they're going to be offering kits for stores to run different events of different games. And these kits will have content that you have not yet seen for these games. So they're going to be supporting the local stores as much as they can with this new Simon Play. Ares has written a lot of details about their new Hunt for the Ring. This is in their series of War of the Ring. This is basically about one player being the Nazgul chasing the other, the Frodo and, and the gang with the ring. And there's two maps. The game is broken up into two chapters. And so uh, as you go by, you're going to hunt for the first half of the game, then the second half of the game. And when you find Frodo, he doesn't necessarily lose. You're just going to get some corruption points. So it sounds like they did some things similar to the, the hunt part from War of the Ring. I'm really pumped about this. It's a great theme, and I hope it works. I love the finding hidden movement deduction games. Button Shy and Nevermore Games have gone together to make Spiel Press. This is a company that's going to be making books for roll and write games. Now, a roll and write game is where you roll dice and write things down. You may have seen games like Quix or Rolling America, Rolling Japan, uh, where you write, you roll some dice, and then you fill the things in, and then you run out. But these books supposedly have different games in them, maybe on the different pages. I'm very curious to see where this goes. I am a fan of the roll and write genre. 
IDW is reprinting Taurus. I had a chance to see it at the Gamma Trade Show, and it was really nice looking. Uh, and this is a classic game, the most complicated game probably to win the Spiel des Jahres over the years. And that's it for the news. Suzanne, what's happening in crowdfunding? We are going old school and then really old school for today's crowdfunding roundup with some fun stuff in between. So let's get going. Stop Thief is Restoration Games' first game fulfilling their mission to bring back old classic games and freshen them up for the modern age of gaming. In Stop Thief, players are PIs trying to track down a thief. The game relies on sounds that the thief makes and those will vary based on their location. Stop Thief of 1979 used an electronic device that is hilariously clunky to modern eyes to help the players find the sneaky thief. By moving to an app for this function, Restoration Games has added a lot of flexibility, including an icon option for hearing impaired players and adjustable difficulty levels. Another key update to the game is replacing the roll and move mechanism with movement cards, unique playable characters, and thieves with individual abilities. And, of course, the game features a full art and graphic design update. You can get a copy of this thoroughly modern, old-school game for a pledge of $29 plus shipping. The Grim Forest highlights classic fairy tales and stories in a fresh way and combines fantastic art with standout components. Grim Forest is, at its core, an action selection and resource management game, as you choose different locations to go to to get the resources you need to build houses of straw, wood, or brick. But there's a bit of deduction involved, because if players go to the same location, they must split the resources there. And then there are also friends that you can gain to give you a special ability, and fable cards that can call down monsters, help you bluff, and creates a lot of gameplay variability. Going back to the art and components, the stellar illustrations by art duo Mr. Cuddington just shine. Uh, the big and beautiful player minis and the 3D house pieces that let you physically build up your houses, well, those just take the game to the next level. You can get a copy of The Grim Forest for a pledge of $49. Cytosis is a worker placement game set within a cell, like biology cell, not jail cell. You'll be placing workers to collect resources or take actions based on the location. Beyond the uncommon theme, a standout feature of Cytosis is the selective endgame goals that players must claim. The trick here is if a player takes their goal too soon, they're signaling to all their opponents what their plan is. But if a player waits too long, then they risk losing the endgame goal that they really want. The included virus expansion adds a pusher luck element to the game as you try to build up antibodies to fight off invading viruses. The campaign also offers a premium collector's edition, which includes an embossed lid to the box and a custom screen-printed molecule meeple set. Full of cell terminology that took me right back to 7th grade biology, Cytosis takes a pledge of $39 for the standard edition and $49 for the premium collector's edition. Ladder 29 themes itself cleverly because it's a ladder climbing style game in which players are trying to shed their hand of cards by playing them in escalating sets. Ladder 29's firefighting theme is highlighted by the great art and designers Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback of Fleet and the Goonies Adventure Card Game fame, well, they've added a nice twist with the drafting of these hot spot cards that dictate a unique player limitation and specific score spectrums based on a player's position when they go out. Bigger risks provide bigger rewards that way. Publisher Green Couch Games has been stellar on Kickstarter in the past, and a copy of Ladder 29 takes a pledge of just $19. Baseball Highlights 2045 Spring Training, first mention, sets players in the future of baseball with robots, cyborgs, and hopeful humans. This is intended as an introductory version of the hit game Baseball Highlights 2045, and it replaces wood bits with chits and has an updated rulebook and reference guides. In Baseball Highlights, you'll be using deck-building mechanisms combined with strategic card play as you battle out a mini-series of Cyborg Baseball. Each card represents a player with abilities at bat or in defense or beyond. If you're already a fan of the game, there's an expansion-only pledge level that will get you just the new cards. But if you're looking for an inexpensive entry to Baseball Highlights 2045, Spring Training takes a pledge of just $19. 
And finally, tribes. Early civilization explores building up a prehistoric civilization. A sister or prequel game to the popular Civ game Nations by the same designer, Tribes is a quick playing game using the clever action selection mechanism in which you pay to skip spots in the action line and then the line of actions adjusts. You'll explore the land, grow your tribe, collect resources, and manage prehistoric events. You can boost your actions using resources and even generate new actions. And like most Civ games, there are tech trees to climb as you go. Tribes looks like a fast and lighter weight Civ game from a Civ game pro, and you can get a copy for about 41 US dollars plus shipping. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, and my childhood is worth a fortune! At least, I assume it is, because several board game publishers are developing games specifically designed to cash in on the nostalgia that I and others feel for the coin-op video games of our youth. For example, we have Turn One Gaming Supplies, who will soon be releasing Space Invaders Dice, based on the 1978 arcade classic Space Invaders. In the dice game, players will still zap away at columns of advancing alien armies in order to defeat the UFOs behind them, and they'll do it by using a number of colored dice with different symbols. But that's not all. There's also IDW, who have announced not one, not two, not 824, but three games based on coin-op classics of our youth. Asteroids, Missile Command, and Centipede. And as of the time of this recording, these games are still in their early development, so little is known about the rules or mechanisms that they're going to utilize. But what I do know right now, at this moment, is that the board game industry has begun banking big time on arcade nostalgia. And that leaves me... Hmm, worried. Okay. Worried for two reasons. First, Trying to reinvent a fondly remembered intellectual property is a potential recipe for disaster, because the new version will inevitably not be viewed through the same rose-colored nostalgia goggles as the original. How could you tamper with this thing that I love? You've ruined me. You've ruined everything. So, does that mean you try to design your new version to be as similar to the classic one as possible? Well, that introduces the other potential problem. See, at their time, Space Invaders, Asteroids, Missile Command, and Centipede were fresh and innovative. But everyone has long since moved on. Fortunately, I believe it's not going to be the license that a game is based on that will determine whether it lives or dies, but the gameplay itself. But that's a factor we still don't know. So let's fill in the gaps. What rules and mechanisms would you like to see in games that are based on these classic arcade games? Should they be kept as traditional as possible, or just use the original games as starting points for new innovations? Now let me know your ideas in those comments down below. Okay, so what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Even though I'll be out of town, we have a lot of reviews coming your way. I have The Banishing I'll be talking about. Um, Z, Sam, Eric, and myself are going to be giving you a preview of first, uh, our first impressions of First Martians. Um, from Ignacy Trebuchek and Portal Games, so I'm excited about that. I'm um, taking a look at the newest Dice Masters Batman set, which has flipping cards. There's just a lot of different games that we will be doing. We're also doing a top 10 list this week. The top 10 things that publishers need to stop doing. Stop it! 
And of course, you'll see content. There's a board game, uh, the Throw Punch launch coming out this week. You'll see more content from many of our contributors. Uh, we'll be doing some new, some Hero Clicks coverage. We'll be starting this week on our channel. So there's just much coming, as well as the live streaming that we did at the Gamma. We've broken it up by company, and so we'll be publishing those separately, and those will be starting to come out on our channel this week. And we might do some live Q and A's. We'll see. We're like I said, we're still setting up the studio and things, so we'll see where that goes. Now, on the Dice Tower Audio. This week is episode 499, which means episode 500 is only a week away, and that's a really fun episode where the original co-host of the show, Joe Stedman, and then the second host of the show, Sam Healy, and then Eric Summer and I, we got together, and a pile of other people. Um, so that's, that's a fun episode, but that's a week away. And of course, there's many other great shows on the Dice Tower Network, and you can find all that at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. A few weeks ago, we talked about giving away Planet Steam first edition poker chips to a lucky winner, viewer, if, as long as you told me that you were interested in this and you had the game. So I went through and compiled a list of all the people, and I'm going to choose you using a roulette wheel. So I'm going to spin the wheel. Your name is by a number, and when that ball hit, stays on that number, you're the winner. So let's see what the roulette wheel tells us today. I will now spin the roulette wheel to find out the winner of the Planet Steam version 1 poker chips. We have five possible winners. Here we go. Round and round she goes. Where she stops, nobody knows until it stops. Here it comes. And the winner is number 33. That would be Tom Evans. Congratulations to Tom Evans. I will contact you. I will find you. And I will send these to you in the mail. So you will be able to add these to your Planet Steam board game version 1. And I know some of you, actually quite a few of you, have contacted me or sent a comment about the Splendor retheme. It's coming still. And I apologize for the delay. I am going to have this done before Origins. That is my promise to you so that I can select a winner, get everything done, and have this sent to you. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. We'll see you next time. Now, I always find it interesting in the gaming hobby how people look at games and whether they're new games or old games. And at conventions, I'll usually ask people, you know, how long have you been in the hobby? Six months, a year? two years, three years, five years, 20 years. And there's always someone who's uh, been there since Methuselah started playing, you know, the first game. Um, but a lot of people get into the hobby at a very new age. So there's always this cyclical thing that we see with games. Like Taurus is about to come out. I mentioned this in the news. For a lot of people, Taurus is a brand new game. You say it's not brand new. It's been out a long time ago. But most people haven't played it. And that's something I find fascinating because it seems like there is a shelf life for games. And then when that game reaches the end of that, it disappears and it can come back later on and be felt as if it is something new. Now, very rarely do these reprints, these come back from the dead type things, really take off. In fact, I can't think of many that have like exploded. I think Survive, when Stronghold brought that back, that was a big deal. They will always seem like a bigger deal than they are because the people who like the original will tell you that it is possibly the greatest game of all time. And they like that game, but they usually don't do that well. For example, Merchants of Venus, which is Eric Summer, my co-host on the show. It's his favorite game. He loves that game, and then Fantasy Flight reprinted it. But it's already basically no longer being printed. Because, yes, there were some people who really wanted a reprint of the game, and they got it when it came out, but it just it didn't catch people's attention. And because games are constantly getting better, these older games sometimes have a hard time standing up to newer games. There are a few games over the years that have stood the test of time. My favorite is one of them, Cosmic Encounter. I can think of El Grande, Chess, you know. There, there are games that will be around for many, many years, but most games have a very short-term shelf life. But I do find it interesting that the game can then come back and people look at it and go, wow, this is a fresh thing. Well, it's not really that fresh. And so there's this constant rushing around right now from a lot of publishers who are rushing around trying to find these older games 
that they might bring back. And I wouldn't be surprised if you hear more announcements made for these over the next couple years. Publishers are always looking for the next great thing to do. That's why you see fads. I mean, everyone's doing an escape room style game right now. But there's always this, hey, I need to find a great game. Well, sometimes rather than finding a designer with a new great game, it's easier for them to go back and say, well, we know this game is great. But those games, do they need to be refurbished? Sometimes yes. Do they need to be tweaked? Sometimes yes. Do the components need to be upgraded? Almost always yes. But I mean, like we see Tasty Minstrel has just republished um, Amon Ray and they republished uh, Colosseum. And we're seeing these games that come back, but I'm telling you that I don't think that they will ever be the hit that they once were. Amon Ray is a great game. It's fantastic. But are you seeing everyone yelling about how great it is? No, because it had its moment in the sun. And this is its second winter to some degree or a second, you know, I don't know, second spring or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's going to make some sales, but then it's going to kind of fade in obscurity. Will you see it come up a third time? I don't know. What I like to know, what I like to hear from you guys are, what games do you think have made a resurgence and come back and been extremely popular? Because there's one game that I know that in its second itineration was more popular than the first. Very rarely does that happen. And I, I really can only think of one, and that game would be Android Netrunner. Uh, Netrunner did well when it first came out, but it was way overshadowed by its bigger brother, Magic the Gathering. And Magic the Gathering did extremely well. Netrunner did well, and for years as a reviewer, people would say, Tom, you've got to play Netrunner. And I would look at the artwork and go, I don't think I have to play it. <laughs> when Fantasy Flight redid it, I expected it to do well, but no one expected it to become this huge mega hit. It was the biggest hit that year that came out. And it's still doing quite well today. It's had a nice new rebirth. Other CCGs that have come back, like Doomtown, <laughs> they just haven't had that same kind of buzz or versus when that came from Upper Deck. So other than Android Netrunner, what games do you guys think have had a huge resurgence? Have we seen more come out for them as time has gone by? Well, let me know in the comments. I just think it's interesting to see how people who are new to gaming, everything is new to them. So these older games feel new to them. And for us who have been around for a while, we're like, oh, that's kind of an old game, but it can still even feel new to us. So I have to start my whole series over of what's on the shelf, but I think you guys will probably not mind too much. So now my shelves have things on them besides just games. So here we go. Here we have Mystic Veil, vale, which is the card crafting game. And I'm starting to see AEG is making more of these card crafting games. So that will be entertaining. Vegas Showdown. I've Oh man, I really like this game. I wish the component quality was better about building your own casino. That's a lot of fun. And Onitama. Of course I like Onitama. It's in the Dice Tower Essentials line. A great abstract strategy game. I got space here for another game. We'll have to get one in there. And then here I have the some. Uh, these are dice chuckers. Basically, this chucks dice, and this one shoots dice, a ballista, and a catapult. And these are for dice towers. Well, that was easy. That's what's on the shelf this week. Welcome to another episode of the best and the worst. My name is Niels Cyril's Brettspiel, and today we are talking about something really dark. We are talking about the. Arrival from Games Up. My favorite part on the arrival is how you determine your income. Let's assume these are my four cards I pick. So I flip over the first two, then I set a so called blocker and say, okay, this row is what I don't want. So you block out this row. For your income, you have to pick one out of these two rows. Then you flip over the third uh, card, like this here. And now you block out this, and now you determine the last one. But what you really get, you only see when you flip over the last card. But after two, you have to set the first one, after three cards, the second blocker. That is clever. I like that mechanic. Brilliant. What I don't like on the arrival is once you did that, that is the first part of your round. It's great, it's gorgeous, you, you really like that. But then the rest of the round is just, it feels like maintains, it feels like just doing, oh, I have this one, so I have to do this and that. So there's not a lot of choice once you decided your income. So it feels like every round, okay, I have this one, I have to do this one, I have to do that one. So it feels a little bit boring after two rounds or three rounds. And then you have another one. Well, okay, well, that's the point I don't like on the arrival. Thanks. 
for watching the best and the worst was Niels from Sorol's Beispiele and the arrival. See you next week. Bye bye guys. character tons and tons of magical coins black cubes interrupt tokens ingredient abilities spell cards for the characters 40 future cards cubes and a dispenser and look some of the cubes get trapped inside, which means you have to figure out which ones are going to come out and affect the prices of the market. Finally, a stock market game that kids can have fun and beat their parents at. So I'm in from Open the Box Games, and you got to check out Prospectus by Mr. B Games. See you next time. Bye! Hey guys, it's lunchtime! Well, sort of. <laughs> Here I am with the Dice Tower at Gamma 2017 in Las Vegas, and guess what? I'm gonna show you some great lunchtime games, so let's check it out. No. So, we're just taking a look at some of the games. I know this one right here is screaming to me because it's, it's cats. Canadian it and it's cats. cats. So. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is a definitely a favorite in the office. There you go. What's the premise yeah. behind this? Uh, um, behind it's the production? a very simple deduction game. Okay. Um, where you're just trying to deduce uh, a culprit of a crime and he's an accomplice. He or she is an accomplice to Furiarty and Furiarty is trying to escape before you, you solve the crime. Oh my god. So it's, it's very simple, you can play it at a bar, it's wide audience, and it's just super fun. So this could be a lunchtime game? Oh, easily. Okay. And the date on, and pronunciation, because I know I'm going to say this completely wrong. Yes. Saikatsu. Saikatsu. And I know you had mentioned something about the art on this one for me. Yes. Last so this time. was really important for us to get the aesthetic right, because it's just a really beautiful game. It's about building a Zen garden. And so we're really, it's been held up only because we are working really hard at making the art, like, top notch. Perfect. But yeah, so this one, we don't really have a release date <coughs> yet for this one. So it's going to be um, sometime probably Q3 or Q4. Okay, so a quick idea on gameplay, like literally like 30 second rundown on gameplay. Yeah, so it's just tiling and you're, you're planting trees that attract a certain type of bird. So on the tile you'll have either a, a laurel, or like a wreath of a certain type of foliage. And then in the center is a different type of bird. And you're just laying tiles and trying to match in a row as many of the same as you can to score points. But the unique part is, is that um, you're a noble on sitting atop a pagoda. Um, overlooking the garden and your perspective matters for scoring. Okay. So everyone scores from a different perspective of the board. And so that, uh, yeah, that's been our big thing is uh, having a big box games but also these small lunchtime play of the games. Oh, that's so awesome. I know. Thank I'm really excited for that. Yes! So yeah. thank you so much. Oh, so I do a segment on Board Game Breakfast. It's called um, Lunchtime. I know, breakfast. But I'm talking about lunch. So it's games that we can play during the lunch hour. So I know you guys have games. I think they're slightly longer. Well, this one actually is a Ticket to Ride Refuge right here. Uh, okay. It's Ticket to Ride Zombies, which is really unique because... You know, do you have it out? Yeah, we have it back here. Tell me about it. So basically you're trying to get from the start to the finish. Okay. And the reason it's popular, it's because it's really versatile, fun to play. Uh, like I said, Ticket to Ride Zombies. So you can kind of get like how the game flow goes. You're either drawing a card, moving, or you can use a card. Okay. So very simple rules. Uh, first kind of zombie game you can play within like 15 minutes. But it comes with a lot of miniatures, 66 zombies. So 
I get like fan submissions on the paintings. Oh wow, so these and are, oh my goodness. This is a painted version of that, what you just saw there. And they even burnt off some of the hands. Oh my gosh, yeah, show, let's show that up close. Yeah, Which that one is that? Is oh cool. my goodness, that's pretty, that's pretty fancy. So we, need, we have one more too, uh, Beta Blots is something you can play in your lunchtime too. Yes, this is great. And it's a robot negotiating game. <laughs> and you're bidding for a robot. Let's say you wanted, you wanted cannon, and you have to beat missions with it uh, by having that many stats. So this is a processor, mm -hmm. and in order to uh, win, you would have to have that process. Unfortunately, our robot only has one processor. So I'd have to either work with other robots or put viruses in other robots okay. or put codes to pump up your robot and you can bid on additional parts as well to actually increase your robot stats. And this plays in how long? Uh, about 20 minutes. 20 yeah. minutes? Okay, so definitely will fit into the lunchtime genre. And refuge would be about 15 minutes. Yeah. 15 minutes? That's yeah. perfect. 15 minutes on Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. EB Games Studio. <laughs> oh, bonjour. <laughs> so, now that it's not crazy noisy, <laughs> yes. and I noticed a few other fun things on the table. Yes. Let's take a close up of that. Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> tell us what we have going on here. And I noticed a few other fun things on the table. Let's take a close up of that. Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> tell us what we have going on here. All right, so Vikings and Wilds is an application uh, that was on Android and, and uh, Google and Facebook. And a uh, year and a half ago, we decided to port this game into uh, a board game. It ended up taking the shape of a game that is a mix of uh, of deck building and resource management, and um, everybody is a, is a chief, is a Viking chief, and for an hour uh, you're gonna build your village, attack each other, um, build resources, um, and, and have fun. Have <laughs> fun. That is the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, those 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 bad guys here is the first time uh, they are shown at the show. They will be released later this year. Okay. Uh, this is coming to retail in two weeks. Finally, it's yeah. been it's been three four weeks. It's in, in, we had very bad luck with custom. We oh no! But it's finally going to be there. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so because it's a deck builder, we have expansion that basically extend the experience of the game. So. Um, uh, this one brings a uh, new form of building, new form of interaction. This one is also a two versus two player, so you can actually team up. Instead of uh, four, four player token here, you only have two. You can uh, borrow, borrow cards um, and, and help each other, so a lot of stuff. We'll see. That's awesome. And sorry, what's the gameplay time on uh, Vikings Grand Wild? It's, uh, I'd say 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Uh, okay. Your four, four people, an hour and a half, so it's fair. Two people, 35. Oh my gosh, perfect. So we're going to try and see if I can squeak this Thank in on the so lunch hour. Thank you so much. And I guess we'll see you in the live stream soon. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See you guys. Bye, there. Bye. So I got to play Dreams at BGG Con last year, so just a few months ago. And it wasn't available in stores at that time, so I was kind of bummed. And so it's good to see it here at Gamma. Um, basically, Dreams, you're going to have these cards that have kind of Dixit-like art if you're compared to another game. They're they're really esoteric and interesting and, and artsy, right? And then all the players, you're kind of, you're trying to fake your way into being a god. You're trying to try to trick the gods into becoming, like, yeah. to be in a constellation. So all the players are going to get their own little set of these stars. And it's, it's a little bit of Spyfall too, because one of these images is going to be the images that you're trying to make into a constellation. And one person is the faker, and they don't know what the image is. And then players are gonna take turns putting out the stars to try to indicate which image is the real actual image. So it's just like in Spyfall, you're trying to give enough, you're trying to prove that you know enough about the game, about the card, that you're good, without making it really obvious to the faker what it is because of course if the faker can play along and guess what it is you know they get to win the round um it's got these neat little dials where you get to set you know as you're voting for who it is it's got these nice little components the crystals come in different sizes and colors and it's very you know in group meta on like well 
what does the bigger crystal mean? You know, is it indicating a head or is it indicating a color or a shade? And so, you know, when you play with different people, it actually plays out a little differently because people interpret things and indicate things in very, very different ways. It plays super quick, it's got a point basis, but it's one of those games kind of like Dixit or other ones where you just play while you're having fun and laughing and really entertain yourself and you kind of almost don't care about the score at the end. But really one round, it's, you know, plays in 10 minutes. And uh, I really liked it, so I'm glad to see it here at Gamma 2017. Awesome, so I think this is lunchtime approved. First up, we have Dungeon Rush. Quick, real-time, light, fun game. Next up, we have Not Alone. In Not Alone, we have Crash Landed on a Planet. Called for help. Found out we are not alone and being hunted. Cottage Garden. Great game. Tetrisy kind of a game where you're filling in your garden. Um, only the pots and the cloches score. The cats give you extra abilities. Says 60 minutes, but can easily be busted out unless if people know what they're doing. Frog Riders. You're jumping over other frogs, collecting those frogs. You can either then save that frog for part of your set collection, or you can turn that frog back in to get other things. Next up, we have get the cheese and get the cheese. Mice are trying to get the cheese. Cats are trying to get the mice. Dogs are scaring away the cats. Quick, fun, light. Pit crew, you are racing, but you are the pit crew. You are not the driver. You need to be the fastest to get your car up and ready. The right number of cars out each tire and guess up the car, fix the engine and get it back out on the racetrack before anybody else. Super Mario Level Up board game. Join Mario and his pals as you advance them up the Mushroom Kingdom while challenging the Mushroom Kingdom bluffing elements. Players gather the most coins and reach the castle at the top. Custom game pieces include a 3D game board, 13 character movers, power-up cards, and black chips. It's for ages 8 and up, 3 to 6 players, and the MSRP will be $19.95. Hey guys, it's the Board Gaming Pinup Girl signing off. I hope you got some good ideas for lunchtime games. Look forward to more of them on our future board game breakfast episodes. Until next time, bye. Today we're taking a look at some dice towers. Now you guys know I'm a sucker for dice towers. These are from E-Raptor and they may be the coolest dice towers you've ever seen. I'm going to show you two this week and two next week. So this week I'm going to show you the two T-Rexes. And so these are made of plastic. These are, I love how this plastic works. You basically snap them together. You can take them apart. Um, it's not too hard to take them apart, but they fit together and are very sturdy. They're made of two dinosaurs on both sides. Um, and then you just drop the dice in like this. And you see they roll out the bottom. Very easy to see. This one's similar. And the dinosaur eats the dice and then shoots them out the bottom. Now, this one is really cool looking, but this one is phenomenal. This is one of my favorite of the four. The two next week are really cool, but this one here, you're dropping them into the, the dinosaur's mouth, and then they just go down, boom, 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 and drop out here at the bottom. Really good. This is a great set piece. I mean, it's a little bigger. It takes up more room than many dice towers do, but it's highly recommended. Good morning, or afternoon, or evening or whatever time it is. Maybe you're in the future watching this in a documentary called Matthew Jude, Just What the Heck Went Wrong. And my question for you this week kind of revolves around one magical and infuriatingly wonderful, awfully horribly fantastic and marvelously horrible word. Reprints. This year a whole bunch of games are getting reprints, which is great, but what about those games that probably aren't i mean they might but they probably won't they will they they probably won't they might do but they probably won't i mean they could do you just wait do you just kind of hope that that game that costs like 500 quid on amazon or ebay kind of gets reprinted or do you just you know sit back relax and play all the other thousands of games thousands but that one I really wanted Viticulture Essential Edition. It was one of those games that I would kind of browse eBay in the small hours of the night when I probably should have been reading or sleeping or hunting vampires. And it was there. I just never pulled the trigger. Not only because that is not how you kill vampires, but because I was kind of all right with just waiting. And then one day I got an email alert and boom, Viticulture Essential Edition, back in stock. Click get in. But I also really wanted Pillars of the Earth, so I bought a German copy of it off a nice northern man. 
And even though the cards are brilliantly mocked up and fantastic, uh, like really, really good job done on them and all that, I found out it's getting reprinted this year. I kind of probably should have waited. Dang it. It's a risky business and I absolutely don't have an answer for you. So I'd love to know whether you should wait or whether you should go for it. And if you've had any really good luck or any horrible, horrible misfortune on the hunt for games. Or vampires, I mean, that's probably interesting too. Goodbye. Well, that's it for another board game breakfast. I appreciate all your thoughts and, and prayers as I travel this week. Uh, meanwhile, have a great time. Lots of great video content, episode 499. We're gonna continue to try to make this studio as nice as we possibly can and try to really, really make our content better. This is because of you guys. You guys are the ones who backed our Indiegogo campaign. It's because of you that we're able to put this together. This is not a clubhouse where we're like, woo, look at all the games we're playing, yeah. No, we're here to work. We're here to make fun content for you guys, hopefully. Hey, convention season has started. There are more conventions on the way. Do you know that there's only, there's less than 100 tickets left in Dice Tower Con? Why have, go and get a ticket now, or, or you won't be able to come to the best convention of the year. Anyway, folks, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.